In the late 1800s, the small town of Aurora, Texas was plagued by misfortune. The railroad had decided against building tracks near the established town, and instead directed their route a few miles to the east. In 1892, an epidemic of spotted fever had killed hundreds of members of the community. In 1896, a drought, a parade of severe storms, and a cotton weevil infestation in the area all contributed to a terrible crop season. Truth be told, the small town and its struggles were most likely not on anyone's radar. Just as the sun was rising over Aurora, Texas on April 17, 1897, a mysterious object crashed to the ground in the farmlands on the northern outskirts of the little town. Despite the early hour, there were witnesses to the event. A news article published in the Dallas Morning News described the airship's crash. It sailed directly over the public square, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill, and went to pieces with a terrific explosion, scattering debris over several acres of ground, wrecking the windmill and water tank, and destroying the judge's flower garden. The article, written by S.E. Hayden, goes on to explain that there was, in fact, a pilot of this mysterious airship. The pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board. And while his remains are badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. Mr. Hayden goes on to report that local resident T.J. Weems claimed that, in his opinion, the pilot was a native of Mars. In or around 1856, Carl August von Steinheil and Leon Foucault developed a process that greatly advanced the capabilities of telescopes. Coating glass telescope mirrors with a layer of silver made the mirrors much more reflective. Once this process was perfected, very large silver-on-glass mirror reflective telescopes were built. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Scaparelli, using one of these telescopes, turned his attention towards Mars. While drawing up a map of Mars, Scaparelli observed what he believed to be a network of channels on the surface of the planet. Because the Italian word for channel is canali, people misinterpreted Scaparelli's findings, and the channels he observed quickly became reported as canals, which the public assumed had to be built by intelligent beings. For better or worse, his discovery had captured the public's imagination and sparked an almost fanatical interest in the possibility of life on Mars. Newspapers were filled with stories speculating about what people were like on Mars. It was assumed that they were much more intelligent than us, and that they were most likely very hardworking. Those canals really were impressive. Professor Percival Lowell was an astronomer and the founder of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He was also a respected businessman, author, and mathematician. In his book entitled Mars, Lowell wrote of the canals and the beings who constructed them. A mind of no mean order would seem to have presided over the system we see. A mind certainly of considerable more comprehensiveness than that which presides over the various departments of our own public works. Party politics at all events have had no part in them, for the system is planet-wide. Quite possibly, such Martian folk are possessed of inventions of which we have not dreamed, and with them, electrophones and kinetoscopes are a thing of a bygone past. Preserved with veneration in museums as relics of the clumsy contrivances of the simple childhood of the race. Some of the world's greatest minds of the day, including Marconi and Tesla, were busily trying to send a signal or a message to Mars. That Mars was inhabited became a foregone conclusion, and people all around America started seeing mysterious things in the sky. For the most part, these quote-unquote airships, as they called them, the term UFO would not enter the lexicon for some time were cigar-shaped, metallic, 
and some reportedly had wings. Mars, Martians, and mysterious airships were daily topics for decades in the newspapers across America. There was speculation, hypotheses, and a whole lot of Mars-related science fiction. This fascination with Mars went on for nearly 70 years. And then, one day, everyone's attention shifted to an incident that occurred in another small town. Roswell, New Mexico. But that's a story for another day. That T.J. Weems was certain that the deceased pilot of the mysterious airship was a Martian doesn't seem so far-fetched when the whole country was certain that Martians not only existed, but they were already visiting Earth via advanced airships. There were many mysterious airship sightings starting in 1896. This was a time when the only thing flying in our skies were birds and an occasional hot air balloon. These people were definitely seeing something in the air. In 1991, the journal World War I Arrow reported on the great airship craze of 1896. News reports of a great airship began in California during November 1896. On the whole, the stories range from simply seeing strange lights in the sky to detailed descriptions of flying machines, complete with flapping wings, fans, and gas bags. Stories about a mysterious airship swept the United States. In tiny hamlets and in great cities, local dailies reported the vessel's progress, its takeoffs and landings, and its majestic flight over the countryside. By all accounts, thousands of people saw the great airship. A memo from the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, on the incident states that the Aurora, Texas event was just one of more than 500 airship sighting reports published in Dallas and Fort Worth newspapers from April 14th through April 27th, 1897. S.E. Hayden's story claims that papers found on the pilot, presumably the records of his travels, were written in unknown hieroglyphics and could not be deciphered. The story ends with, The ship was too badly wrecked to form any conclusion as to its construction or mode of power. It was built of an unknown metal, resembling somewhat a mixture of aluminum and silver, and it must have weighed several tons. The town is full of people today who are viewing the wreck and gathering specimens of the strange metal from the debris. The pilot's funeral will take place at noon tomorrow. In a similar article about the incident in the Fort Worth Register, But in this account, there was no mention of the hieroglyphics, and as to the pilot, it simply stated, quote, The pilot who was not an inhabitant of this world, was given Christian burial in the Aurora Cemetery. That grave, located under a now beautiful mature oak tree in the old Aurora Cemetery, can still be visited today. Through the years, Hayden's story has been scrutinized and judged by many to be a hoax or a prank, and some even thought it could be an early example of a government cover-up. For most of the world, the Aurora, Texas incident faded from their memories. 76 years later, however, Aurora would once again make headlines. The Aurora, Texas incident gained renewed interest in the 1970s, largely due to the efforts of Bill Case and Jim Mars. In 1973, Bill Case was both the aviation writer for the Dallas Times-Herald and the state director for MUFON. After being told the story of the Aurora crash by Hayden Hughes, a colleague at the International UFO Bureau, Case wrote a series of articles on the incident for the Dallas Times-Herald. Through his investigative work, he discovered that some of the family members of the original witnesses were still alive and willing to come forward to tell their stories. Jim Mars was a journalist and author with an interest in UFOs and conspiracy theories. He read with great interest Bill Case's series on Aurora. And in 1973, Mars published his own article about the Aurora incident, which brought it to the attention of a wider audience. The new witness testimony was very compelling. One witness, Mrs. Mary Evans, 92, was 15 years old at the time of the crash. I was only 15 at the time and had all but forgotten the incident 
until it appeared in the papers recently. We were living in Aurora at the time, but my mother and father wouldn't let me go with them when they went up to the crash site at Judge Proctor's well. When they returned home, they told me how the airship had exploded. The pilot was torn up and killed in the crash. The men of the town who gathered his remains said he was a small man and buried him that same day in the Aurora Cemetery. That crash certainly caused a lot of excitement. Many people were frightened. They didn't know what to expect. That was years before we had any regular airplanes or other kinds of airships. Another witness, Charlie Stevens, who was 83 in 1973, had been just seven years old when he and his father were putting their cattle out to pasture that morning in 1897. He claims they both saw a cigar-shaped object with a bright searchlight attached to it pass overhead. It was very low to the ground and was headed north to Aurora, which was about three miles away from the Stevens farm. Shortly after that, they heard an explosion and saw a fire that lit up the sky over Aurora for several minutes. Stevens claims his father took one of the horses and rode into Aurora the next day. When he returned home, he told Charlie about the scene of the crash, a debris field of torn metal and burned rubble. Charlie's father, Jim, explained that the nose of the craft had first hit a windmill causing the chain reaction explosion that followed. The revival of the story surrounding the mysterious crash, along with the newly reported eyewitness testimony, prompted MUFON to conduct a rather extensive and thorough investigation. And although more than 75 years had passed since the crash, they were able to find some very puzzling new evidence. In 1973, investigators reconstructed the events of the sightings and were able to locate the crash site. Using metal detecting equipment that was modern for its day, along with eyewitness accounts, they were able to find and retrieve pieces of metal of various sizes and types. Bill Case wrote, From all indications, there was definitely an explosion. The pattern established by metals recovered indicates the craft exploded on the lower right side, first blowing bits and pieces over a two or three acre area east and northeast of the well site on top of a rocky limestone hill. Immediately the rest of the craft exploded throwing other samples to the north and west. The sample was retrieved from a location about 100 feet west of the well site beneath four inches of soil. It was lodged directly against the face of the limestone rock and conformed to the exact configuration of the stone, indicating it was in a near molten state when it penetrated the earth and hit the rock where it cooled. First they said, oh, this looked like a slug of something. And after a week or so, I said, hey guys, where'd my metal? And they said, well, it's kind of intriguing. We want to run a few more runs. The metal proved to be a kind of aluminum, and it was impossible to make aluminum this pure in 1897. It would still be difficult today. The investigators also went about searching for the gravesite of the alien. They were at first unsure of the credibility of the story of the Christian burial in the old cemetery, and finding the grave was proving to be more difficult than they had imagined. But then, the investigators received a tip. Bill Case shared what the tipster said in his MUFON report. You are looking at the wrong grave. Look for these landmarks. A huge old gnarled oak tree over 200 years old just south of the south entrance road in the old portion of the four plots of the original cemetery. A large natural beehive has been in it for years. Below the south side of the tree, under the branches, is a grave with an unusual carving on it. According to Case, these instructions were accurate to the letter. They were quickly able to find the grave and its oddly carved headstone. Once it was located, they got to work with their metal detecting equipment. And, sure enough, their device alerted them to several large metal objects buried below. Sadly, once the metal and the headstone were discovered, both were stolen from the cemetery. A crime that remains unsolved to this day. Naturally, the next step in the investigation would be to try to exhume the remains. This is where MUFON's four-month investigation came to a halt. 
The town and its cemetery association said no to exhuming the alien pilot's body. Curiosity seekers, vandals, and journalists had overridden the town and created a circus-like atmosphere. Things got so crazy that volunteers of the cemetery association had to have night-long vigils in the cemetery to prevent the grave from being disturbed. Included in MUFON's 199-page report was an article written by Texan journalist Dennis Stacy regarding the whole Aurora situation. He wrapped up his reporting with this. The association sought an injunction to resist any attempt to disturb the Aurora Cemetery grounds by any third parties seeking to investigate the alleged airship crash in 1897. To overrule the association's veto would require an act of Texas legislature. Such an act, MUFON officials acknowledged, would incur legal fees that were more than the organization could bear. Well, let's face it, John, UFO investigators have been fighting an uphill battle to gain credibility for decades now. Although we may think the evidence is overwhelming, the people who'd have to authorize the digging are far more conservative. And the end result of that, I suppose, is uh, this could remain a mystery for another hundred years. Could be. So, if the body of a small alien pilot who passed away in the early hours of April 17, 1897, is buried in the old cemetery, his eternal resting place will remain untouched for the foreseeable future. Today, the town is still somewhat divided when it comes to its history regarding the crash. Some embrace the legend good-naturedly, while others condemn the story entirely. There is one thing for certain. Something, or some things, were flying around in the skies in the late 1890s and beyond. During this time, there were airships in early development by Earthlings in various countries around the world. However, none were advanced enough to make the trip from California eastward by way of Aurora, Texas. Unless, of course, it was a government cover-up after all. In the description below, you'll find links to MUFON's report on the 1897 Aurora, Texas incident and books written by Jim Mars and Percival Lowell. Also, just for fun, I'm including a link for an independent movie from the 1980s that is very loosely based on this event. Thanks for watching this episode of Getting Spooky. If you enjoy this sort of thing, please like the video and leave a comment down below. If you have something spooky you think I should highlight here, let me know. Until next time, be safe and get spooky.